the quiet silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By his sacrifice, we are now saved. By his grace, we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky, the grave could not hold him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By his power, all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by his wounds, we're made alive. With us this morning, he is alive. Hallelujah. We ran out of that grave, didn't we? I was buried beneath my shame.
good singing. Have a seat. Welcome uh, to Easter worship here at Crossroads. We're so happy that you have joined us. And a uh, lot of new faces today. I've met people uh, who've just moved into town. Many of you have lived here for a bit longer. Uh, but regardless of whether you are here every Sunday or this is your first time, we welcome you uh, to our worship today. I want to share with you uh, from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, our scripture today. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of, of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who had told all these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we understand the skepticism that so many felt on that first morning, the disbelief that, that this could happen. But Father, we thank you that it did happen, that it's reality. We thank you that these witnesses who at first did not believe it could happen, came to see the risen Jesus and then gave testimony and gave us your word as the witness of those events. And here we are 2,000 years later. Most of us here this morning, not because we're still looking for proof, but because by faith we have chosen to believe that Jesus did rise from the dead. And he's alive today. And he is present with us. And we come before him today to worship the risen Lord and Savior. Thank you for the, the difference that resurrection makes in everything. And we pray for your presence in our church, in our lives. We pray, Father, that as we leave this place in a while, that we will take with us this confidence that we are not walking through life alone, but that Christ is in us. And we get to take his presence and his ministry wherever we go. Lord, bless this service, and I pray that all that we do here today would bring honor and glory to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Stand with us this morning. Y'all, we're going to sing. We're going to do some singing. Amen. Y'all, this is an old, old song that a lot of y'all are going to know. And if you don't know it, it's easy to sing. But it, the words are so magnificent and they're so wonderful.
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Here it is. Because our God is robbed
Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered dead. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father of this throne. Come on, sing it out. And the judge of Christ was born. On this blessed day, Lord, we come before you with hearts overflowing with gratitude and praise. And we thank you, Lord, for your glorious resurrection, for conquering sin and death, and granting us the gift of eternal life. And in your infinite mercy and love, you sacrificed yourself for us, Lord, bearing the weight of our, of our sins upon the cross. But on this miraculous day, Lord, you rose from the grave, triumphed over all of darkness and despair with joyous hearts. We lift our voices in thanksgiving, Lord, celebrating the victory you have won for us, Lord. Your resurrection fills us with hope, Lord, fills us with courage, Lord, and unwavering faith. May we never forget the magnitude of your sacrifice and the boundless love you have shown us, Lord. Strengthen our faith, Lord, and guide us always in your light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection and for the promise of salvation it brings. And with grateful hearts, Lord, we praise your wonderful, powerful, and holy name. And forever and ever we will. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line between old and new. 
between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Isn't that a creative way to remind us of what, what is reality and why we are here? Luke 24, we're going to explore this this morning and uh, try to get a sense of what it was like for those eyewitnesses on that uh, resurrection morning. In one of his books, Brennan Manning wrote about something he had become aware of, and um, I've since seen documentation on this from a number of authors, but Manning, I think, was the first one to popularize uh, the reality that, that this is taking place every Orthodox Easter Monday. Now, that's going to fall differently on their calendar as opposed to the Western uh, Church's uh, calendar. But what Manning writes about in his book is that Orthodox monks many, many years ago were sitting around and talking about Easter, talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And one of them pointed out that it was like the ultimate cosmic joke that God played on the devil, who the devil, watching Jesus, the Son of God, die on the cross, thinks he has won. And then early on Sunday morning, this is the musing of that monk, early on Sunday morning, God said to Satan, watch this. And he raised Jesus from the dead. And with that, all the brothers in the monastery sort of slapped their knees and laughed a big uh, laugh. And then at some point following that, they started talking amongst one another and came up with this uh, creative way of celebrating the Monday after Easter. And apparently they still do it every year. On Monday, Easter Monday, they, save up, they have saved up all year long their best jokes. And from the morning till going to bed at night, they tell each other their biggest, funniest jokes as a reminder that God has had the last laugh on Satan. Now that's one way to think about the resurrection. For me, Easter is an intensely personal day because as a 10-year-old boy at a Easter Sunday night, there used to be such a thing, Easter Sunday night worship service, I prayed and told God how very sorry I was for my sin and asked Jesus to save me and be Lord of my life. So even though Easter moves you know, within about a month's uh, range on the calendar. For me, I always think of Easter as my spiritual birthday. And my prayer this morning is that if you have not come to faith in Christ, if you've not experienced this salvation that he has made possible, that that would be, that would be your experience before you leave today. I always find myself going back to Luke's Gospels more years than not, for the Easter story. Luke, you remember, if you've been here in a part of our uh, Gospel of Luke series on Sunday morning, remember from those early weeks how I would remind you that Luke is a careful, meticulous, methodical researcher. He's a doctor by training, but he's an awfully good historian as well. He didn't just slap together stories in any of the events of Jesus' birth, ministry, or death, and resurrection. Like the careful researcher he is, he finds eyewitnesses to the events, and he interviews them. You can hear him saying, I want to know exactly what you saw. I want to know who said what. And the Gospel of Luke reflects that sort of careful research that Luke did for us. This is important all the way through the story of Jesus. How he came into the world is important. 
how he left the world is important. The details of his birth, the details of the cross, they tie together. They're not separate events. Tim Keller said, Easter proves that Christmas was real. Sit and think about that for a moment. Easter proves that Christmas was real. So, we're going to look at a group of women who were the first to the grave, the first to the tomb, and how when they became convinced that Jesus had been resurrected, they go back to tell the men who don't believe them. And some of them say, well, I've got to see it for myself. It's not an all bad thing. It sort of points out the reality that, that we come to faith in different ways. We come to faith either being quickly convinced or sometimes with a bit of a struggle. Here's the big idea for today. If there was no resurrection of Jesus... You know what we're left with? We're left with, the, with only living for the moment. And with what understanding and strength that we have within ourselves to face life and death. But if Jesus was resurrected, if he was brought back from true physical death, then there is a basis for our faith. There's a basis for hope and purpose in this life, there is power to be saved from sin, and there is power to be obedient to God. Everything hinges on whether the resurrection happened or not. Every preacher I know that I've ever spoken to about this subject, we feel a weird pressure about Easter. We know we're celebrating the central event in the gospel. But we all wonder if we're going to be able to talk about it when the day comes, when the morning comes. Talk about it in a way that makes sense, that connects to you. What's behind that is we don't want to miss the opportunity to tell you what God has done for all of us. I really appreciated the counsel of a young pastor, Daniel Dickard. He's in the process of leaving Greensboro, moving to a church in South Carolina. He said this to pastors. Your worship service on Easter doesn't have to be spectacular because Christ is spectacular. The resurrection is supernatural. Just tell them about Christ. And worship will be spectacular and supernatural because our focus is on Jesus. And so that is my simple prayer this morning, that you would see our spectacular Savior as we read these words and come to an understanding of them. Beginning in verse 1. On that day, the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. A simple observation here, these women prepared for this moment. Their visit to the cemetery wasn't because they were sitting and sipping a cup of coffee and someone said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to go, we ought to, go to the cemetery. No, all weekend long, that Saturday where we have so little comment from scripture about what was happening in the lives of the disciples we know this these women were making plans you see they were sort of locked into their homes on the sabbath day saturday and uh, in that time they talked together about the fact that in the rush of friday afternoon when jesus body was taken from the cross nobody was able to properly prepare him for burial so we need to ladies we need to go take care of that as soon as we can. And as soon as we could, they could was early at sunrise on Sunday morning. And they found the stone when they got there, rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
Verse 4 says they were perplexed about this. Well, I would be too. So would you. What, what has happened? We have 2,000 years of reading the scriptures, of knowing this story, of being told this story, and now many teaching this story to others. But they don't know what's going on, at least not initially. So there is confusion. They are perplexed about this. And then, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. These are angels. So Jesus' birth, his coming into the world, was announced by angels. And now his resurrection is announced by angels. Verse 5, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, well, I would be afraid too, and so would you. Don't get your idea of what an angel looks like from Western artists because they tend to always make them look um, unusually friendly and approachable. And if you read the Scriptures, almost inevitably people are afraid when they see an angel. There is something about their being, something about the glory of God reflecting through their, their being that frightens people. They've never seen this before, and so they naturally are frightened. They get down on their faces, bowing their faces to the ground, and then the angels speak to them those famous words, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the resurrected Jesus in a place of death? Fair question, isn't it? Jesus is alive. They're, they're not saying all of this from what we know, but the, it, it's sort of underneath it. He told you this would happen. So why are you looking for a dead man when Jesus has been resurrected? He's not here. He's risen Remember how he told you. And at that, their minds must have been racing to all of those moments, especially in the last few months as Jesus had resolutely set his eyes on Jerusalem. And he would say to them repeatedly, I must die, but I will rise again. You can tear the temple down, but it'll be rebuilt in three days. Sometimes it was in language that didn't immediately connect with them, but looking back, thinking back, remembering his words, it all begins to connect. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And he must be, the must be goes with this next verb as well. He must be crucified. And on the third day, he must arise. And they remembered his words. Sometimes we just need a little poke, don't we? Some prodding. Think about it. Think about what you read in the Word of God. Think about what Jesus has said about this subject. And returning from the tomb, verse 8, they told all these things to the eleven. See, you notice now it's the eleven, not the twelve, because of Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. Judas has taken his own life. And now the church, what will become the church, the large following of Jesus' disciples at this point, they are led by the eleven. So they tell them and to all the rest. Now it was, who were these women? Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women. So we don't even know how many in total were there. But this fairly sizable group of women who were devoted followers of Jesus. And now simply, before they understand the resurrection, they simply want to honor their Lord by taking care of the practical needs of his burial, of his entombment.
Well, they went back. Convinced. Absolutely, by faith, they believe that Jesus is alive. He is not dead. And they go back and they told these things. At the end of verse 10, you see this. They told these things to the apostles. But these words seem to them, to the apostles, an idle tale. And women, if you, on behalf of your sisters of 2,000 years ago, feel a little bit insulted, you should be. They were dismissive of these women. They were dismissive of the story that they were telling. In fact, the words idle tale means, are you ready? Incoherent nonsense and babbling. So these very intelligent, credible women are just brushed off. And it, again, drives home this point, doesn't it, that we come to faith in different ways and on a different timetable from one person to the next. They were quick to believe. The apostles are slow to believe. But there is one, and uh, one of the other Gospels tells us that he didn't travel by himself. John runs with Peter. Uh, the apostles did not believe the story, but Peter and John, there is something inside of them that makes them want to see for themselves. So, as Luke tells it, Peter rose and he ran to the tomb, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. The language here means, it reinforces the idea that everything is in order in this cave, this carved out burial place. It's, it's as though his body has passed through the cloths that were used to wrap him just two days ago. And they are there in order as, as though what the women said had actually happened. So Peter looks in. We know John comes and he looks in. They both believe and they went home marveling at what had happened. They go back to where the disciples are all gathered. And they have a different story than they did when they first left. They say, we believe what the women said. We saw with our own eyes. We believe that Jesus is not still dead. That somehow God has brought him back to life. Now... There's been a lot of discussion over history about proof of the resurrection and whether these things can be investigated in a way that an intelligent non-believer could make sense of it and make a, make a decision about whether you believe in the resurrection of Jesus or not. And one of the things that inevitably comes up is the belief a false belief, I think, but a belief that these stories were simply made up. That the early Christians invented the story of resurrection. They made this up and they spread the story and it just sort of caught on. Let me tell you that Luke does us a huge favor here by including the details of the women and their role as first witnesses. If you were going to be making up a story that you were hoping would catch on, you would not have women in Jewish culture 2,000 years ago be the first witnesses. You would have the apostles. But here, the Lord arranges for all of these women to be the first ones to put eyes on Jesus. And then they convince the men, you need to come look at this and come to your own conclusion. And the men come and they believe. And then all of a sudden we have massive movements in faith as people begin to recount, oh yeah, Jesus did say these things, they were going to happen. Okay, I want to take some remaining time that I have with you and give you several lessons from the graveyard. Most of us have spent our share of time, more than we would ever want to, 
standing in a cemetery, standing in a place of death, what can we learn from this first century graveyard? Well, the first lesson is this. The experience that these disciples had taught them that even when God is silent, He remains sovereign. We know the details of the crucifixion, the death of Christ. We know the details of Sunday morning and the resurrection and all the appearances of Jesus that are about to start to unfold. But on Saturday, often referred to as the day of silence, the day when all of those same people were sitting in their homes and talking together and weeping together at what felt like a lost dream. It felt as though God had gone silent. What they could see on the other side of Saturday, when Sunday and resurrection finally became real to them, they saw that God was still a sovereign God. God was still in control of all the events that were taking place. Do you believe that? Not only about the events of 2,000 years ago, do you believe that in your own life, that when it feels difficult to hear God, that He is still there, He is still on His throne, he is still in control. A second lesson from the graveyard. Failure to know or remember God's promises will leave us in the emotional and mental condition of the women in those first few minutes, perplexed and frightened. If you don't know what God has said, if you do not remember what He has promised, you will be perplexed about your life. You will be frightened about what's going on or what might happen in the future. You see, if you don't know what they were reminded of, that Jesus must die on the cross, this is all just a great tragedy, isn't it? If you don't know that Jesus said to his followers, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, you are apt to live in despondency every time something terrible happens in your life. So it's incredibly important to know what God has said, to know His Word, to know His promises, and then to remember those promises when that moment is dependent upon them for you to make sense or you to simply hold on to your Lord. A third lesson from the cemetery, from the graveyard. To remember God's words, we're going to have to first know His Word. So what did Jesus say? And we're given the gift. The early church was given the gift, and it's been preserved for us, of the actual Word of God, the, the inspired, recorded Word of God. Do we know this? Do we understand that this is God speaking to us? How are you going to remember what God has said if you've never read what God has said? To remember His words, we have to first know His words. And one of the amazing promises that Jesus had made, this will be back in John 14, verse 26. He says, now even when you can't remember, I'm going to help you out. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... He will teach you all things and He will bring, listen to this, He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. They had forgotten His resurrection promises. Now God used both the angels and I believe the Holy Spirit to help them to recall the specific words of promise that Christ had given them weeks, months, and years before. What promises that the Lord has made to you have you forgotten? It just calls us once again to get back to the Word of God. What, what sadness have we 
experienced in life because we didn't know a promise that God had given that would speak to us in that sadness. What sense of defeat have you gone through? What sense of being overwhelmed in your circumstances have you endured because you're not remembering or worse, you don't even know what Jesus has promised you? A fourth lesson from the graveyard. We're all in favor of resurrection. But to experience resurrection, there must be a death. So for the resurrection of Jesus to have meaning, there had to be a death. That's why that word, that powerful word in Scripture is used, must. He must die. He must go to the cross. He must be delivered. He must rise again. These are the words of God. It has to be. This is the plan of God. This is all a requirement. This is the same word that Jesus used when he was talking to Nicodemus one night, and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus, there's no other way for you to be saved. There's no other way for you to go to heaven. You must be born again. Same word. Jesus must die if there is going to be of resurrection. So the crucifixion of Jesus, we're reminded one more time, it is not an unfortunate series of circumstances. It had to happen. It was by the Father's design. And now, because death had come and that death had a purpose, there is resurrection. Even spiritually, on a very personal level, this is a truth that we must understand. How can you and I walk in the power of Christ? Empowered to be obedient to Jesus? Empowered to say no to ungodliness, yes to righteousness, as Paul would write to Titus? Well, I have to die to self in order for Jesus to raise me to walk in his spirit. So daily there has to be a denial of self, a dying to self, in order to live and walk and move and live in the resurrection power of Jesus. Lesson number five, and I'm not even going to elaborate because it's sort of self-explanatory. Not everyone will believe your story about Jesus. All the Marys and all the Marthas and all the other names that those women carried they initially weren't believed. Don't sweat it. Keep living your life walking with Jesus and praying for those who don't yet believe. Number six, a sixth lesson from the graveyard. Faith is that personal experience and personal choice that every person has to decide for themselves. Trent Butler wrote this. I want you to... Listen to his words. Denying Peter was so impulsive. He was the inquisitive Peter. The women's story pricked his conscience and challenged him. Take a look for yourself. Here the open tomb is taken for granted in the narrative, but Peter easily enters the tomb. His response to such easy access was not recorded, but the two men did not appear to Peter. The two angels didn't appear to Peter. All the evidence he had to go to were the cloths that had wrapped Jesus' body. And this sets him to wondering. No, no one would remove the wrappings and then steal the body. Only a person needing to walk away would remove the cloths in the fashion that Peter found them. Could the women's story be true? He came to faith in Peter's way. As God worked personally with Peter. All right, we're going to close with one quick look in a book that bears the name of Peter because he wrote it. 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now, if you are among the great majority of people, 
and I'm sad to say even the majority of churches who think that our place in heaven is determined by our hard work. This verse is going to trouble you, and it should. By God's great mercy, he causes people to be born again. It is a work of God in the individual's life. He causes us to be born again, Peter adds, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter is giving testimony here, not just instruction. He's telling his own story. Can you picture him at the empty tomb? And he goes from not understanding, not having faith, not resurrection faith in Jesus, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead as God causes Peter to be born again. In verse 4, he adds this, We are saved, we are brought to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is kept in heaven for you. By God's power are being guarded through faith. Your salvation is not only the gift that God gives you, God keeps that salvation for you. You don't hold on to salvation by having more good days than you have bad days. Because guess what? We have more bad days than we have good days. That's just the, the fact of fallen men and women. But God doesn't yank his salvation away from us every time we have one of those bad days. That salvation and all that it entails, Peter declares, is being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It is an inheritance that God keeps for you. Now, there will be a day when faith is no longer required because faith has to do with believing things that we cannot see with our physical eyes. So one day we will see Jesus, Paul says, face to face in all of his glory. And the reality that we had believed by faith is ours. What God has been holding, what God has been keeping for us is revealed in all of the detail and all the splendor of what salvation is, of all that God is. All that being said, I want to give you three challenges, three questions to ponder this morning. Number one, because of the resurrection, you can be born again. If you've never been born again, will you trust this morning in God's mercy to save you? Number two, in the resurrection, we can see what really matters. I mean, death has a, has a way of clarifying things, doesn't it? In the resurrection, we see what really matters. Will you choose this morning before you reach the point of your own death, will you choose to treasure Christ above all so that when your death does come, you're prepared? And a third Easter challenge, the resurrection of Jesus, the meaning of the cross, the salvation he offers us, these are all matters of faith. You must decide if you believe, do you? There's no reason to be unsure about that right now. Nail it down. Do you believe in Jesus? J.I. Packer, he said, we as Christians have something better than hopes. We have something better than positive thinking and optimism. Would you listen to his words? Optimism is a wish without a warrant. Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. Optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will ever actually come. You hope so. But Christian hope 
expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with truth on the basis of God's own commitment that the best is yet to come. It's so much more than positive thinking. It is based upon the certainty of who God is and what God has said to us, what God has promised us. So like those women and the men that they take the good news back to, you must decide whether you believe what has been said about Jesus. I plead with you, if you've never done this, fall at the feet of the merciful risen Jesus and ask him to do what nobody else can do for you and what not one of us deserves. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for a relationship with God. Trust him for your salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago. You declared absolute, total victory over Satan, over our sin, and over death itself. Father, I pray that we will live in the reality of those truths because they change everything. They change everything about life. They change everything about how we ought to be making decisions. They change everything about what priorities are. And Lord, we pray for our friends, some of whom are in this room right now, trying to decide if they will believe. They are no different than Peter and John, no different than those women. I pray, Father, you would work in their hearts to cause them to be saved. And I pray for your children, for your sons and daughters. God, if we're not strong this morning in our faith, make us strong. Make us strong by reminding us of your word and all that is true. Give us, Lord, the power that only you can give us to be obedient to that word. It's in Jesus' name that we come to you and we pray. Amen. If you'd like to, let's stand and let's sing and respond to God's word. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. 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 
great. That was great. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful uh, Easter. It's going to be beautiful all day, so get out and do something. Go see somebody. Uh, there's a connection card. If this is your first time at Crossroads. Take a minute. Fill that out. Ken and Vanessa will be at the back of the room. We would love to give you a gift bag from the church and just say hi to you. A couple of quick things. Benevolence offering today. If you uh, have that, you can do it at one of the little back boxes. If not, um, you can uh, get that in later or however you normally do it. Reminder, there's no midweek services this week. Uh, so all of the different things that normally happen here during the week will not be happening. Next steps will be next Sunday. Uh, we do need to know who's coming. You can use this card for that. We need to know the number of adults, number of children, uh, provide lunch and child care if it's needed. But take a minute and do that. And we would love for some people to sign up for that. And then also early registration for volunteers for Born to Excel. That's coming up quickly. So volunteers, if you want to go ahead and get registered, then we'll be opening up to everybody else. Again, we're glad everybody's here today. Hope you have a wonderful Easter and Trey, great music today. Thank you. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday. Be blessed. We'll see y'all next Sunday.